Okay, episode four of the <laughs> expat experience. We have the giggles here in the studio today. I'm very, very excited to have Mo and Emma here, who are going to be sharing their story, both about becoming expats here in Saudi, what route they took, what they're doing now, but then also how life has been here because it's kind of changed significantly time, really over the time, years. Obviously. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. So next time you'll see us, we shall be on air talking to the people of Saudi and also talking to you. So enjoy. Welcome back to The Drive Home. It's myself, Coach Pete, and you probably heard a little bit of nervous laughter, a little bit of nervous energy a moment ago, but there are two important guests in the studio today. So I would say colleagues and friends. So it's great to have them on the show. And I mean, they both have pretty incredible stories and they're both generally pretty incredible people. So I am going to pass over. I don't know who's going to go first. <laughs> they're both like, no, 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 the other one. No, you. So Emma. Hi. Introduce yourself. My name's Emma. <laughs> um, I'm from East Sussex, but used to live in London and been in Saudi for about a year and a half, coming up to two years. Okay. So yeah. And how has that been? Or well, first of all, what brought you to Saudi? Um, job. So a new opportunity. I think I was ready to leave London and just I wanted to explore a different culture and Saudi was was the opportunity that came up. Because usually I guess people don't really put Saudi up at the, the forefront no. when wanting to work abroad. I so, never thought in my wildest dreams I'd live and work in Saudi Arabia. And so what was it about the, the opportunity that was so different that you couldn't resist? Um, I think because it was COVID times as well back at home, so it was definitely the right time to move. And it just, a gut feeling, is perfectly honest, like it just felt right to, okay. to, to, to go, yeah. Okay, so we'll move over to Mo. Hi guys, <laughs> it's Coach Mo. I'm here since 2013. I graduated uh, 2012 and uh, moved to Saudi. I actually graduated from computer science, started as a software developer in 2013, and I switched my whole career in 2018 into the fitness industry. And yeah, here I am till now. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to take this honestly opportunity to be in the fitness career because it's changed my whole life. Yeah, because it was, I mean, we, we heard stories back when we were working together, but yeah. it sounded like quite a, a significant change. It's, it's a big one because I used to be overweight. Like this is one of the reasons. Uh, I used to be 115 kilograms and uh, I just took the the chance like to learn about you know the fitness and everything and this has took me to a completely transformation I'm now like healthier feeling stronger I'm 85 kilograms so that's a big transformation for me which has completely changed my whole life and now you're uh, you're training champions yeah <laughs> as well which, which we will which will come on to to later so yeah. Emma what is your kind of What's your experience here so far? Like what has been the upsides? Would you, are you thinking of going home at some point soon? No, so originally when I came, it was for a year contract, but Saudi is very different to what you think it's gonna be when you arrive. I think it's a very welcoming culture. I think working in core, like where there's a lot of international people that makes settling into Saudi a lot easier. Mm. Um, but it's definitely somewhere where I see a lot of opportunity, especially in the workplace. So I don't see myself. I was actually saying to Mo on the drive, I couldn't imagine living and working in London now. I know, I'm um, the same. So I do see myself here for quite a while. Cause what, which what, is a nice feeling. Because what's the big shift? You know, you're doing something similar in terms of role mm. in London versus here. Like, what's the big shift? Because London, you kind of think hustle culture and everything like yeah. that. So what's the, how's the lifestyle changed for you here? I think that's the main thing. The lifestyle here, I think, is a lot better. I think I was ready to leave that, almost like the hamster wheel of London, mm. where you're waking up so early for the commute. It's You're almost in a little bit of a box. Whereas here, it's you don't have that horrible commute. You've got the sun, you've got the beach on the weekends. It's generally a healthier lifestyle, I find. Yeah. And so, has, has that meant you've been able to craft time for other things for yourself? I mean, I train and work. They're the, <laughs> <laughs> That's they're the main thing. I, I see. And, I, and beach on a weekend. I see your story. It suits me. <laughs> at like 6 a.m., it's yeah. like, oh, Emma's back up. Yeah. She's, uh, she's on the rower before <laughs> anyone's up. Yeah. Which Watching the sunrise. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so, yeah, just the, overall, the lifestyle I find for me at this 
moment of my life suits me mm. really well. Amazing. So, yeah. And Mo, for you, like, I think you're in an interesting position where you've been here for quite some time. Yeah. And over that period, there's been lots of us, lots of, you know, other expats coming in mm-hmm. and maybe adjusting, you know, may not be adjusting. Like, what have you seen from, from that point of view, from seeing the sort of swathes of people come in and go? Yeah, I think since I came to 2013 till now, like, I, I've seen, like, the whole change for the for the country i'm saying uh because back in the time everything was different um if you're gonna go out it's all like either you know singles or family mm. uh, if you go out into uh, cafes or restaurants um it's forbidden to play music and all of these things even like meeting up with people wasn't that easy you know and the culture and everything uh but compared to like let's say a couple of years ago when everything started to having more events and uh, getting people from outside, like people coming as to- tourists and everything. We're having now more international people coming in and this has given us more experience. And it's, I mean, it's more open, it's much better than mm. before. So big, big change since 2013 compared to now, which is honestly amazing. Like I'm really enjoying it. Amazing, because I think uh, one of the big things that we talk a lot about on this show is that uh, expats come over and they they're looking or some of them are looking to just get rich mm. and sort of take 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 from the country yeah. and i think you know one of the the things that we've seen over the, the years being here is that you know if you perf- or try your best and if you put your best foot forward and and sort of help other people or impact other people especially you know as a coach yeah then you know it's it's going to be so much more than just the money. It's so much more fulfilling and and rewarding. Anyway, for me, so for you, Mo, being a being coach, Mo. No, I agree on that honestly, big time. Because you you're not only here to work, you also create connections, yeah. And this is, will help with lots of other stuff as well, like outside the work. Uh, you create uh, not only like friends, but you, you have colleagues and you get to know new people. Um, experience different places with them and you know different experience I think also the wellness industry is relatively new out here so Mm. we can actually Mm. have quite a big impact which is a part of my job that I love whereas Mm. obviously in London it's very saturated it's very competitive and for the people what what is your job what's your job role so I'm a member experience (laughs) manager (laughs) so yeah I just think it's good to be part of something that is a growing industry Mm. Because I think there's there's lots of well, especially sort of abroad, mm-hmm. the fitness industry is saturated, yeah. yeah, heavily, heavily saturated, mm. and I think that is why, um, you know, Saudi that it's a great opportunity and it's like a, a territory that you know is like nowhere else in the world. Mm-hmm. Where where are you going to go? Where you are kind of of a few, yeah, rather than of many, True. and to be I guess in a situation where you are with such kind of a great network mm-hmm. um, or set of individuals, yeah. it kind of gives you a like. We've been lucky because we've come to Saudi and we've been in this bubble yeah. almost. Um, I always talk talk about a friend. It is a bubble, though. Uh, yeah, I think. yeah, no, it, no, <laughs> yeah. it is. I always talk about a friend called Jack. I, I don't know if you met him, but he was from Liverpool, and he would sort of drive an hour and a half down south of Jeddah to the warehouses and, wow. and work with people, people there. And mm-hmm. so he had he sort of saw no Europeans. He, he kind of his his existence was home, drive, commute, warehouse, and back again. Yeah, and so. You met him, yeah, Emma. Yeah, we went, we went him, to the yeah. beach, didn't we? Yeah. And so for that, I think it's so key to be able to not only have a network inside your your work and your colleagues, but also go out and meet people. Mm. Because otherwise, you're just going to be stuck in that Netflix binge at home on the weekends yeah. Yeah, exactly. or sit by the pool by yourself, which is quite yeah. lonely. And then I think your time here isn't probably going to be enjoyable and then mm. you're going to end up leaving. Mm-hmm. And especially as an expat, like you don't want to just come and work and go back home, as you said, like just uh, between home and, and work. You just want to know having new networks and connect with people going out for different, uh, you know, uh, activities and stuff. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think like I have a couple of friends who came here for a year and they're like people who just want to want to work. So mm-hmm. they finish work, they go back home, they can go to the gym, but they don't want to uh, interact with any other people and in a year they're like going crazy mm. so of course like if you're not willing to you know speak with other people go out uh, explore 
uh, doing some activities, get to know different people, then definitely going to go crazy. Yeah, and I think sort of that's what kind of what I was asking before, where you've got you've seen lots of expats come and go. Yeah, I mean, both all of us have to some extent. Yeah, and I think the ones that sort of go that route are the ones who don't branch out or the yeah. ones who don't try try different things or experience different things because ultimately like you're here mm. and you are in a totally different culture well for yeah. me and Emma like you know, the similarities very, for you very like, different like, couldn't be more different yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it would be so easy just to revert back to what is comfortable i.e. staying at home sitting by a pool mm. or going to work but I think as soon as you push yourself out of that comfort zone then that is almost where the magic happens exactly. and I think yeah. also that that's the difference with, say, if you're in London, it's very easy to almost socialise and go out after work, whereas here you have yes. to almost make the effort to mm-hmm. do that. Mm-hmm. So if that's not, if you don't like going out your comfort zone, then it is hard. Yes, yes, I yes. would say that that's the bigger difference. And because I was, I was someone at university who went and struggled making friends. Mm. I, lit- I literally just, um, the people who I went to secondary school with just hang out us again. Yeah. So, <laughs> I am just terrible, <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Uh, with that so it's it's sort of it's always nice when you're in the workplace and there's people who are on a similar journey to you yeah, yeah. and then you can obviously relate rather than go out fresh but obviously some people some people have to so I think if you're coming here or if you're new here and you're listening you just have to get out and yeah. uh, say hello explore guys <laughs> yes yes explore hobbies yes. which I think we're going to come on to in a moment <laughs> cut to a short music break and we'll catch you in a moment Oh. Easy. Not too bad. Like the first bit is the worst bit, and no, then you, it's fine. You're good. You're good. He knows how to. <laughs> no, no. I I chuck yeah. someone under because I learned. I chucked someone under the bus last week. Um, this this lawyer who came, yeah. Ahmed, and like I just sort of said, like, ah, introduce yourself, and he's like, ah, what, what do I do? Uh, That's what I said. <laughs> okay. Oh, Welcome back to the ride home. We are currently taking selfies. I don't think I was included in that. Moment, so um, I, won't, I won't take it personally. Um, but for those who have just tuned in, this is Coach P. It is Wednesday. You are driving home, no doubt, facing all sorts of traffic as usual. I think that the biggest thing when callers call in is they just want to moan and vent about being stuck in traffic, especially yeah. Riyadh traffic. Yeah. Anyone who says Jeddah traffic is worse than Riyadh traffic, no. like, no. <laughs> really? No. <laughs> okay, so if you have tuned in, we are here with Emma and Mo, who both have, well, different stories coming to Saudi, but they have, have sort of come together and united into what has been a pretty strong uh, sort of unrivaled force, which we will talk <laughs> about in a bit. But I think, first of all, um, one of the important things and something that we all experience as expats and just generally people in life is that we... It's not all sunshine and rainbows. There is always downsides, you know, even though we kind of love life here and we don't want to go home and our future is is here, if all is well. You know, we we can't ignore those situations Mm. which are are tougher and um, require a bit more self uh, self control self control <laughs> especially on the roads but yeah so so talk to me about that maybe you you go first emma what have you sort of okay she's pointing at mo she you needs, go needs to think one. she's got she's got too many bad things to talk about she needs to pick one uh, so mo how about you first of all like what what is a struggle here because i think maybe let's start with the loneliness side of things if you are not even just just an expat, just someone here. You can it can be quite isolating in a way at times. Yeah, I would agree with that. Again, as we were speaking before, if you're here new, try not to just stay isolated. Just go out, explore, and just get to know new people. You just um, have to make more of a conscious effort mm, yeah. to build a social life. I definitely find it's not yeah, as easy you, as London. If you just stay at home, you, you're just going to do nothing. And it, will, it will just build more pressure and stress on you, and it will be too much. But rather than having more people to talk to mm. and going out, this is, will be more... Uh, good for you basically i think one of the big ones is like fitness right like yeah. gyms are great places to meet people yeah. yes. and just whether it's classes whether it's just being on the gym floor and, yeah, and sort of seeing the same people over again mm-hmm. and then starting a conversation yeah. you know embrace some sort of hobby because i think that mm. is is sort of a shared passion between people is a, is a talking point rather than just being the weirdo who approaches someone in a cafe yes. <laughs> yeah. not that i've done that just to be clear <laughs> and it's actually in a positive way like if you go to the gym you're, you're going to be working out and you getting to know new people so it's a positive 
uh, route to step. go down. Yes. So if we're gonna speak about like the the, the downside, the bad and the ugly. <laughs> uh, I would go with the roads. Yeah, right. <laughs> which is I think like everyone gonna speak about it. On on 2016, we uh, started like doing cycling. Cycling wasn't a big thing here. Uh, there, That's road no, cycling, yes. Yeah, road cycling. Yeah, and there is no routes for uh, like you can use the bicycle, you know, in the street and stuff like that. So we started with a small group of ten people, and I remember we used to go like at night because we were trying to avoid the the traffic. Death. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we always go like around I think uh, eight p.m. from Corniche, like uh, mm. the Sheraton. And then we could go all the way north to uh, King, uh, Abdul Aziz, uh, mm. King Abdullah's uh, palace, like mm. near Core. Uh, and man, honestly, I don't know why, but we always go uh, beside the side, um, the side road, yeah? And we just get these people driving by as close as possible to us, which is like almost want to kill us. I don't know why. They probably don't know, <laughs> never seen a cyclist before. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, but honestly, we had lots of dangerous uh, situations happen and until like we had to rent a car and someone driving mm. it behind us just to, we call it safety car, yeah. just to make sure that we're in safe, like if you're on the road. So basically that was really bad. Because <laughs> I see that now you get the groups of cyclists who are all lit up. Yeah. Mm. Like all of them are kind of blowing whistles yes uh, yeah. and they have the cars as well now it's uh, now it's completely different like they evolved and progressed big time you know we we had to put like lights on our um <laughs> jerseys and on the bike just to make sure that everyone can see that there is cyclists on the road <laughs> yes okay the one uh, thing i do miss is walking me too oh. me too that is like yeah a because of the weather but also there's not really anywhere Everyone just drives everywhere. I yeah. mean, the only thing like the, they did recently is, I would say, like three, four years ago, the the Corniche, yeah. yeah, which is really nice, but it's only a specific place. And still, ultimately, you have to drive somewhere to, to walk, walk. Yeah. yeah, which which totally gets yes. me. And when I was back in the UK, what was it, a month ago? Oh no, it was just great going out just for a walk. Out Rain, the shop, shine, yeah, anything. yeah, nip out to Tesco's and <laughs> Man. Yeah. pick up some ice cream and yeah. walk it back. <laughs> it's so good, yeah. Mm. It's like here, you 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 hardly do 10k steps yeah. a day. oh 5k and, yeah. and then co compared to like when when i used to go to london it's just minimum 20k a day minimum, yeah and then you can go even and that's more. you being on your feet all day as well yeah. in the yeah. gym walking back yeah, and forth exactly. meeting people rather than sat at a desk i found it such a weird concept of like the, especially at call the members come to do their 10k on the treadmill oh, no, no, no. it's just a way <laughs> a weird and, way and they all have treadmills walk. in their home yeah it's true <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. walkways either or. yeah but no, what, what would you say? What, what have you? What has been different for you? What have you struggled with here? Anything in particular? Because you mentioned your uh, your mum coming and sort of observing something or noticing something. Yeah, so I've got blonde hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the big things is everyone would look. Like if I go into a mall, if my hair's down, um, everyone would stare, not in a creepy way, like we said, but it is that there's not many blonde people. Mm. Um, whereas I just kind of switch off to it. And it was interesting when my mum came and she was like, can you not see everyone looking at you really? and like really highlighted it but my one bugbear is saudi timing saudi that's, timing. <laughs> that's my one bugbear because i don't think there is timing in saudi i feel like i feel like or you, it's half an hour or 45 you, minutes you might you may be getting be. there because we we had a show at five today and you turn oh, up to at be like fair, five fifty uh, four, four forty four fifty seven. sorry <laughs> that was the traffic one that's traffic. everyone's excuse anyway the traffic yeah. <laughs> we were supposed to arrive like Four four uh four forty, yeah. yeah. So what what is it about the, the timing? The lack of timing. The lack of understanding what being on time is, mm. I would say. Like we were just saying, like especially if you go to like cinemas or things like that, people come oh in forty five minutes late. It, it's just yeah. Torches on I'm, looking for their seat. Yeah. That's uh, everything. That's for me. It's just sad. Ruining the yeah, experience. Yeah, You've got to like... get there for the trailers. The yeah. trailers are the best bit. You also get the popcorn before. Yeah. Get Man, the trailers, I, everything. I take Just cinema so seriously. He does, he does. <laughs> Honestly, when we were working together 
<laughs> I think I probably still owe you for a cinema ticket. That's okay. That's okay. Although that time we watched Bad Boys in the front row. Oh yeah. Like my neck, <laughs> my neck after looking up. But it, it's the, like only, the only the seats up. I imagine. But thank you, Mo. You would always, you would always organise stuff for everyone. Yes. But I think <laughs> that's also cinemas. what you need in colleagues. Like you need. I'm awful at organising. Me too. Can't do it. Which Mo has realised since he started coaching me. <laughs> um, but you need someone who is there to organise like cinema trips to get everyone together, For especially sure. as an expat, to kind of build you into the community. Yeah. I think yeah. that helps. Because it's funny, the um like there's someone was asking about like who to contact for to go to like the British embassy mm. gatherings and parties and I think I've only been to one of those I haven't in even my been life. To one, actually. Um, have you not? Well, there's no. one on the first of December, so I'll uh, sign me up. I'll sign me. I mean, I'm, I still have no idea how to sign up. <laughs> I'm, I'm in chats with someone, um, but yeah, like there's these things that are put on, and it just requires you asking or putting yourself out yeah. to to, mm -hmm. to meet those things. But um, any other any other bugbears? Any other bug roads? I mean, the you, roads. I, you, the love the U -turns, is... don't you? you love the U-turns. You love the U-turns. Man, the, the driving. roads are horrible. Who and you terms. turns into a fast lane? That's my question to the <laughs> listeners. We all do. We all do, no? <laughs> see, they're trying to put cameras everywhere just to, to see, like, even, like, with the U-turns, because some people, like, yes, take, yes, yes. go all the way, pass the whole, the, the whole queue, and then and just go, go in, yeah. cross and take the U-turn. They put cameras there, but sometimes it's not working. And I feel that sometimes as well, people don't care. Okay, I'm going to pay the fine. But I'm just, I'm, I'm in a hurry, yeah. so I need to do this. Also, that's the difference, because in the UK, obviously, you get points and then you lose your license. Exactly. Here, it's just yeah, 20 sar, 100 sar, 500 sar. Well, no, it's not 20 sar. <laughs> what are you doing for 20 sar? <laughs> but you know what I mean? People just pay it. They yeah, don't, they don't, yeah, yeah. There's no consequences, really. Well, if you don't pay, you don't leave the country. <laughs> well, all that's, that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a big one, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no exit to entry. Oh, 50, 50 grand of tickets? Nah, I just won't, I'll just stay. I won't go on all day. Um, but no, it, it is improving, I feel. I mean, over the years, like people have been saying that speed cameras, there's actual kind of yeah, no, you know, with this. consequences. It's happening. Yeah. So I think it just starts with the education, doesn't it? And mm. um you know, people actually having to pass their test first. Yeah, no, that's a big one now because I know a lot of people were, especially from Egypt, unfortunately, because they go... <laughs> Representing. Um, <laughs> so they go back to Egypt because, honestly, back in Egypt, uh, the driving there is crazy and even... Even worse. Even worse than here, big time. Uh, but even, like, people to get the license, sometimes they pay money and they don't do the tests and then they just get the license mm. and this is the problem. And recently here in Saudi, for specific countries, they said that even if you have a license from your country, you can't transfer, like, uh, uh, they, don't, they don't trust it. Yeah, so you have to at least, you do uh, a test and then they see, like, how good you are. And then you're still going to take, like, the minimum is two practical hours mm. uh, driving and four mm. uh, theoretical, I think. Really? Because I remember yeah. Jay. Yeah. Um, at work, yeah, yeah. Jay, yeah. He, um, he, he, they wouldn't accept his Nigerian license. Uh -huh. So he had to go and sit through the classes. Yes, yeah. Well, obviously, the being an Arabic as well. So <laughs> he obviously. How did you do that? Well, I think you. <laughs> you know, he passed, he passed, I think. Exactly. He passed. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so. Uh... Just guessing. <laughs> it's the same with Calvin at the moment because uh, he also like was supposed to exchange his uh, license and he's African. taking 10 hours. No. 10, pra 10. 10 practical hours. But that's, I mean, to be fair like that's that's good like you need the barrier to entrance yeah. or entry harder because yeah. you need to up upskill everyone who's actually mm. on the road who you yeah. know has life and death in their hands yeah i agree with this honestly because again back to the egypt thing like um people goes and pay money just to take the license so mm. you never know from here if, actually... if you want to come come and exchange your license are you really can drive yeah, or not? yeah, yeah. so so my, my, the question on everyone's tongues at the moment is, did you pay for your license in Egypt? hundred <laughs> oh, percent. What, what, what's the going rate? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 that's recent, but uh, yeah, mine, I, oh my God, that's uh, <laughs> I've seen you drive. I crashed a lot of times, not, not a big crash, but like learning to drive with my cousin. I will never forget this. this is the first time I'm trying to learn on a ladder, which is like the steering wheel you need a big biceps to be able to go oh, and really and right. That's why you got into training. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, and yeah, the experience was crazy. I, I definitely did lots of crazy stuff, but I've done it properly. I've learned, I did my test and I took my lessons. So I earned it. <laughs> oh, for sure. And I'm sure there'll be uh, 
a young Mo in the back seat at some point for oh, you to uh, maybe take to care take care of. of. Exactly, <laughs> driving along at forty. 40 kilometers an hour <laughs> oh my god i'm not sure about that but yeah maybe <laughs> which one the 40 or the baby <laughs> <laughs> oh smooth now <laughs> yeah it's going you're there. even on the radio yeah it's going there what we or what i want to talk about now is kind of more more the industry that you're in so you're both in the, the fitness or the wellness health Yep. well-being yep. industry in your time here i guess particularly mo you've been here sort of longer period how have you seen all things fitness evolve in that time here in saudi because now there's a massive massive push yeah. across many many different sports and disciplines which obviously emma that's why you're uh, part of the reason why you're on <laughs> you've got a story to tell there um but how would you say over the years that has developed and um what's the current state of things now and where do you think it might go in the future honestly i would start with um it's a huge huge evolve that the fitness industry i mean the way it's evolved from since i came to 2013 and compared to now especially the last let's say four or five years is completely different now uh, because so while I'm, I was working as a software developer and then I joined Allen as a part-time there was not a lot of big gyms you know it's just like the commercial gyms where everyone goes and you have like 100 people in the mm. in the in the room just doing you know exercise and it was very little stuff that you get people doing boot camps and uh, different classes so fitness at that time wasn't big uh, sports, what we know is always like football, mm. you know, uh, this is like was the main thing here in Saudi and yeah, you, you don't hear about different sports, but compared to now with lots of events happening, something like Saudi games, which has just happened, one of like the, this is the top event, sport event happened so far in Saudi. Um, this is a huge difference than before and, um, how they actually keep pushing people on, uh, trying different sports and trying to uh, compete uh i think trying to really raise awareness aren't yeah they? the awareness mm. is is big time from our gym yeah the, mm. the amount of people is training for uh competitions and yeah. different events is now way bigger than even when you were there mm. you know people can see that oh this person joined this event and they're doing really great so why not we try and push ourselves and try to train for mm. a specific event so we have like let's say around 10 people doing uh triathlon in december oh, um, amazing and another people doing half marathon and marathon uh event as well in december uh, so it's amazing seeing people trying to push them te uh, themselves to um like achieving different goals you know mm. this is big time difference because i think it, it is that awareness thing that um you see other people doing it and yeah. you're like oh I, oh so there are facilities it is possible to do it it is possible yeah. to try Once things you see someone able to it's like oh yeah it's exactly. a possibility. I'm sure. I'm sure you've uh, inspired some people. A Emma. lot. <laughs> yeah, there are definitely more members who are like booked up to things since then. So are they joining you at six a.m. though? No one's joining you at six a.m. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so let's let's go into that a bit more. So you talk talk about it. What was the recent triumph or experience that you had? Um, so I competed at the Saudi Games for the women's indoor rowing and came second. So, yeah, amazing an amazing achievement it was the whole experience was amazing like the the whole weekend at the games like they did it amazingly and like the rowing team everything afterwards like i love competing and i've missed it um but yeah it was a very special event to be part of because how would you well how did you initially get into that because you would have thought okay saudi games well, i'm english <laughs> yeah, probably not for me that's so, a funny story it is a bit of what is um, it waster <laughs> So I um I wanted a bit of a fitness challenge anyway, mm. and I was talking to Mo was taking a rowing class, and there was only me and the head coach in the row class, okay. and um, Angela was actually like, oh she should do a marathon, and I was like it doesn't interest me at all, I don't want to run, and Mo was like oh you're quite strong at rowing, have you tried that? Um, so I did like a half hour test row, I think. Yeah. And then sort of like dabbled in it a little bit. And then yeah. he was like, Saudi Games, it's a million star prize money. <laughs> so I was in. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's the main thing, you know. No, you mentioned... A, li a little first... bit of financial incentive. Yeah. Well, first of all, it was nationals. So we started training for nationals. Yeah. Which is in January. Mm. Um, and then the Saudi Games came And then we knew up. about Saudi Games, yeah. Uh, um, 
So yeah, basically this is how she started. Uh, so for whoever listening to us, um, <laughs> I'm also like I'm a coach and I, I used to do rowing. Uh, I competed in the uh, Saudi national uh, competition in 2021 and 2022. Uh, so the experience was amazing, honestly, and like going through the whole training and um, experiencing the training is not easy. It was difficult. To give to give a bit of clarity to that, yeah. when I when I would be working at the same place as Mo, I would sort of <laughs> go off. I'd have a, or I'd kind of leave the gym, and Mo would be getting on the bike or getting on the rower. I would go off, take a client for an hour, go have lunch, go have a nap, and I'd come back, and Mo still would going. still be there, plugging away. And I would look at the time and be like, "Oh God, he's actually still going. He hasn't, he hasn't even had a break." So oh it, I mean, it is grueling. It's it is. Crazy. It requires a lot of discipline. So it's, how how did you find that Mo initially? It was honestly, it's the more it's mentally challenging, big time, more than physically. I mean, definitely both of them are challenging, but the mental part is the big part of this uh, sport, because you spend like two, three, sometimes four hours training a day, as you you and the other trainers were always telling me, how, you're crazy, like how <laughs> you spend like two hours in the rowing, you know? Let's do some bicep curls. Yeah. <laughs> So honestly, with my training, I just used to do only two strength sessions a week and the rest are all cardio like between running uh, on the bike or rowing. Uh, so the long sessions is very challenging mentally. Mm. But after the first month, if you have a goal and you're disciplined and you determine that, oh, I want to achieve this, then you're just going to keep fighting your thoughts and whatever people say, you know, you want to do this, you're going to keep going for it. Because I had times where you basically just my mind speak to me like, "Why are you doing this? What's happening?" Like you <laughs> every, spend, every five it. minutes on the rower. <laughs> yeah, spending two hours in the rowing, and then if I at any point I quit and I just like listen to my mind, I would. You have to switch it. I would definitely wouldn't continue. You know, mm. uh, it's that part that you have to be have the mental toughness to because, keep going because that's the thing and people talk about discipline versus motivation and obviously the the one million real prize <laughs> prize for first it's, it's motivation at first motivate, but yeah, that's but not going to keep getting you up at no, five o'clock in the morning no, no. to go and sit on the rower an hour before mm. work mm. um that is where the the character and the discipline comes in yeah, and yeah, yeah. how did you find that when mo went through <laughs> the training program first time so... round and was like okay <laughs> Emma, so what we're doing is... Well, we were saying initially, actually, because he eased me in nicely. Okay. <laughs> but the the mental challenge was the big thing that I wasn't prepared for, I think. I didn't realise it was going to be that mm. tough. But I remember doing one session, which I think was about an hour on the rower. Yeah. And then a 5K run afterwards. Oof. But this is like an hour recovery session for me. And I remember when I did it, I said to Mo, that was absolutely horrendous. Like, that was so long. And he must have been sitting there thinking, she has no idea what's coming, <laughs> what's coming around the corner. Us, no. Whereas now it's, it is, it's like three, three, four hours. Yeah. So it's long. Three, four hours uh, training. Training. a day. Mm. Yeah. And is that split up? Yeah. So it, it depends on the, like the workout. The session, so yeah. Some days we have like, um, so we, I program for her every week, yeah, because it depends on how she feeds every week. Uh, it's very customized for her. Uh, so we usually have three to four times rowing a week mm. um, and then two strength sessions a week. And beside that, like, we have a bit of, like, two sessions run, two sessions bike. But usually it's the main focus definitely is rowing. Um, and it's different phases. So if you're going to, like, one phase uh, would be aerobic, so low intensity, mm. but this would be long. That's longer. Yeah, yeah, So yeah, I'm yeah. in that so, lovely phase at the moment. Ooh, <laughs> since we started, I said, listen, this is going to be challenging. And you have to understand that if you're disciplined, you have to fight with your mind. You have to have that mental toughness to keep going. Because if you quit, you're just going to quit. Because mm. it's a long session. So you're going to have that in your mind every round or every 10 mm. minutes that, oh, no, I'm tired. I don't want to continue. This is mm. too much. You, as you said, you, you find people sit down and finishing and sessions beside you, <laughs> coming in and out, and you're still going in the road. E eating a donut in front of yeah. you, <laughs> teasing you. Because, yeah. cause, sorry. Yeah, so uh, from this, honestly, she's been amazing in terms of she's so disciplined, determined, and um, just waking up five in the morning to finish her workout and then having the rest of the day to uh, to to work is, is just crazy. And she's been doing this 
every single day. She only has one day off. Uh, and she's been training really, really well. So I'm very proud of her. Honestly, like second place. We only train, by the way, for five months. That's it. Really? We didn't prepare for a whole year. So five months to get second beside the, like the national team players. This is a huge uh, accomplishment, honestly. Big time. Yeah. So More to come. Yes. More to come. Yes. <laughs> That's the beginning. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the, um, you know, you embarking on this journey... What I guess I mean obviously it's something that you probably never thought you would do. No. When you were when <laughs> yeah. you were in London being like, Yeah, I'm going to Saudi, gonna compete in the Saudi bit, games. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that must be a sort of bucket list type yeah. thing to be able to achieve. And you know, I think when it comes to people moving, upping sticks, coming to a different country, a new country, everything's totally different. I feel like that is a real golden opportunity to, mm. to focus on yourself, whether that be a hobby, a skill, an art, whatever it might be, or your fitness, because there's really no better time because yeah. you, you have all this have time, time back, time, yeah. right? You, you've, you don't have a commute really mm. anymore. Um, you know, it might have been an hour and a half now, it's 20 minutes, if that. Yeah. And so you've got all this time back and it's so easy to sort of fall into bad habits mm. and not do anything yeah. and yeah. just snooze, sleep in. But if you have a goal, which you obviously did, it just drives you and motivates mm. you even more. So what would you say to someone who maybe is fresh here or, you know, they've been here for a year, a couple of years or, or just, you know, someone who's had their life here, but is struggling to take that first step. What would your advice be? Both of you from the coach and the athlete. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got to find something that you love doing. I know it sounds weird I that say, I you, love you... <laughs> sitting on the row for three hours a day, but for me, I'm very much, I love having the focus. I love how hard it is. I like that not everyone can do this. Mm. So for me, it's, it does, it's mentally I've grown as a person so much over the six mm. months like having to have that discipline having to even like my nutrition recovery like everything but also for me it's given me something to focus on outside of work that's just yeah. for me which is nice um and like I'm the fittest I've been so overall everything is positive for me yeah apart from being tired most of the time <laughs> Tired, yeah. Yeah, getting angry. Yeah, I was very, <laughs> very frustrated session this morning, I'm but just, I don't really, <laughs> but, but does, also you had, like having obviously Mo's been through the training, so he understands it yes. as well. But I think I've never really had a personal trainer or a coach, mm. and for me, like that whole journey has been amazing. Like I've loved the journey. Like the, the icing on the cake was coming second at the Saudi Games, but this is something I'm going to continue. Yeah, regardless. So I think you've got to enjoy the journey and the experience. Yeah, because would so, you say that has crept into other areas in your life, this sort hugely, of discipline? Hugely, And I think the, the mental, like I said, I didn't realise the mental barriers I'd have to cross with this training. And they're all self, self-imposed self and your own limiting yeah, beliefs, right? It's all what you say, and like you're having to switch that into a completely different state. Mm. And that did just start with rowing but now I take that into my career to other areas so yeah. I think as a person I've just become a lot stronger yeah um and I think you can generally in any area of fitness that's what it that's what it does give you yeah and that's why I love the industry mm. so yeah. and Mo for you what would your advice be to someone who's who's thinking about taking or starting something taking a first step I would go honestly with uh don't be scared to take the step and try something new yeah mm. because uh it i'm not gonna say if you fail but uh if this happened you're just gonna learn from it and actually try something else but if it goes well with you it will change you mm. uh, and in terms of like my experience and also coaching emma through it uh it won't only like just give you that um like becoming stronger in this thing but also like as Emma was saying that it changed her life like completely it's about work about opening up her mind more that it's like a mindset growth mm -hmm. basically uh so it changed your life completely not only physically but mentally it just gets you in a in a different place which is better 
And that goal can literally just be, you know, go into the Corniche to walk, mm, yeah, go into yeah, the mall yeah, yeah, yeah. to walk, get your 10k mm. a day. It could be starting a new Small, sport, jiu-jitsu, yeah. horse riding, mm. anything. Or it could be, you know, going all out to the Saudi Games yes, or Olympics. Exactly. Why stop at the yeah. Saudi Games? Yeah, why not? Exactly. Olympics. Um, but it, it is that thing where it just, you know, whatever it is, like set your sights on that because there are so many things that can go right yeah. in that, you know. Yeah. In your pursuit of whatever it might be, you might make a new friend, you might have these conversations, you might meet new people, you'll find out more about yourself. That will trickle into other areas Mm. of of your life, perhaps professionally, and you get that promotion because you have a new energy. Like there's so much to benefit from fitness that sitting on the sofa doesn't compare. I mean, do that after you've put in the three hours on the wall. (laughs) That is allowed. We'll, We'll allow that. Um, but no, I want to hear more about the uh, the competition specifically. So we'll cut to a short break. So thank you. We'll catch you after the break. Ooh. So we were talking about everything outside of training. Mm-hmm. What is important for people to be aware of? It's not just about going to the gym. It's not just about accumulating miles or time or re- reps or sets or whatever. Mm. What is equally, if not more important to the training? So I think the the thing that definitely changed all areas was the nutrition side. Yeah, that's a big time. Big um, one. So I had a, an amazing coach called Marina who <laughs> did all my nutrition. Um, and like I was saying, I think I saw my performance completely accelerated once we put the nutrition plan in place. Mm. Um, but again, just every other aspect of my life, like I was eating enough to not be going up and down or reaching for the third coffee in the afternoon, but the the impact on my performance was huge. Mm. Um, and then the, the third thing, when you're training for that intensity, for those hours, it's the recovery side. Um, so like Mo said, I only get one rest day a week. So actually you have to make sure that you're recovering your body mm. as much as possible so that when you're training again, it's ready to go. Yeah. And um, what's, what's recovery for you? Or what was recovery for you? The recovery was mainly the cold plunge. <laughs> <laughs> it was a crazy one to which, yeah. when she started, but uh, um, yeah, I, pro- so yeah. I pushed her. So she's doing well now. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm very lucky to have amazing facilities, so mm. I could get like a deep tissue massage, but also the sauna steam. But the cold plunge was the main, the main one. To and help and what about sleep? Sleep is sleep, sleep is something everyone should yeah, do. Eight, 8 p.m. <laughs> to get up at five, so I should be in bed 8 at eight p.m. <laughs> yeah. She's you... not allowed to have less than eight hours of sleep. I'm gonna say when I was this leaving is... work, you were still there at that time. You had a yeah, bed. So you had a bed under the uh, under the desk. Yes. Yeah. So that's the one thing I would say I struggle with at the moment because okay. I have to get up early it's getting enough sleep in yeah. um, but then again I guess that keeps you uh, keeps you honest in the evening yeah it controls what yeah. you're doing keeps you focused yeah and that's the thing you, you do have to but I'm quite an all or nothing person I like being able to put everything yes, into something yes. um, so yeah doing it half-heartedly isn't my character <laughs> so being able to focus on the nutrition on the recovery and the training I've really enjoyed because I've only really ever done the training. Yes, and because you were saying as well, the, the the nutrition for you has always been from a place of, oh, I want to lose weight. Yeah. So I'm not going to eat basically yeah. much. And so I think when you look at it through the lens of eating or look at your nutrition as, as a means to fuel and nourish, yeah. then your fuel, nourish your body so that it yeah. can do these amazing things. And I think that is probably one of the things that we talk about to clients the most mm. is it's not yeah. just about starving yourself for the fat to drop off or to lose mm. weight. And it's, I think with with everything in the industries we're kind of brought up looking at fuel looking at food in that way as a woman I would say yeah like you avoid carbs you do this and I think it took a couple of weeks when we were increasing the calories and I wasn't seeing changes and all of a sudden when it changed I was oh so many people have been telling me to do this my <laughs> whole life it actually works <laughs> but it's almost like it's re-educating people mm, mm. I wish honestly everyone listened to this because this is what we always get uh like in the gym, like with the clients, uh, I want to lose weight. I don't want to eat carbs. And it's misunderstanding of what carbs actually does to mm. your body. Because if you're, we have some clients that honestly training a lot, like doing a couple of classes and then doing a PT and then finishing their 10K steps. And then sometimes they come in the evening for another class. Mm. So you burn a lot. But at the same time, if you can fuel your body properly, then 
you can keep going for like a week or two, but then your body gonna collapse. You will crash, yeah, so, you will get injured. So basically carbs is gonna fuel your body, but definitely you have to um, like calculate it properly on how much you should eat every day. But sometimes people when say, no, I would have to cut carbs. No, this is not something good. No. Carb loading before the competition was great. Oh, okay. <laughs> <She> was, <laughs> My best I'm few sure. days. <laughs> I'm sure. So everyone, if you love your carbs, just do a competition yeah, and then you get, get to have free rowing. reign <laughs> over them. But no, I think what would be interesting to know is is sort of what your mindset was going into, well, both of you actually from a different angle, your, your mindset going into the competition and sort of stepping up to the rower, mm. nerves or, or kind of were you quietly confident and equally no, you being the coach, were you like, oh, my oh God. she best perform, <laughs> otherwise I'm going to look terrible. <laughs> So we'll start um, with you, Emma. Like, what was the the mindset and the the journey of going up before you were pe- to before. perform? I think mindset is something I had worked on a lot throughout training because I think it's something that I needed for the for the training anyway. Um, so I was very in the zone before actually. Yeah. Um, but it was interesting because Mo will say a different story. Mo seemed really calm around me on the day. <laughs> he was very calm, so that really helped me. And I just put my music on, and I think because I didn't really know any of the other athletes, it was very easy for me to just be like, "This is like I'm going for one thing, and I'm going for gold." Yeah. Um, the 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 most nerve wracking was when you sit sit on the rower. You hold them, yeah. and then you wait for them well. to <laughs> say "Ready, Set, Go," and that was when. That was my hu- moment in. of being nervous, but then once you go, you just zone out. Because that's the thing, like you, you, uh, you've done it so many times. Yeah. You've practiced it so much. You've completed two thousand meters mm. so many times, which ugh, it gets worse every time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's different when you're like into a competition and you have fans in front of you and people watching, yeah. cameras, and everyone is there. It's it's just it's completely different because let's say when she does all of this training and doing lots of two K, she's in her comfort zone in the gym. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So she doesn't care, like she's fine. But when you're there actually, this is like what plays with your heart. Because you can see this, especially with the training, just thinking about the competition. Your heart rate every, your heart rate raises. Yeah. yeah. So this but is funny. Imagine in the competition itself. The good <laughs> the thing though, they did a pre qualifier on the Friday. And then yes, the finals yes. was on the Sunday. Mm. And I do think that was really good because yeah. you kind of went, even though you had to do the test twice in three days. But it was the easiest 2K was, I've ever done. Yes. <laughs> um, but it is, it kind of, you did the experience. So I think then mm. you're... And I guess when you've done a competition, you kind of then know what to expect. Yeah. And yeah. then it does get easier to mm. some extent as you yeah. go again. But um, next time you'll be a, a defending... Defending your silver. We're, go, we're, going, we're, going, we're going for <laughs> no, the gold for in January. Gold. Yes. In January, is that the next one? Yeah, nationals. Okay. Oh, nationals. God. So, yeah, that, uh, so, so you've got to get on your recovery then. Yes. You've got to get that I'm going not had again. I've a chance then. to recover. <laughs> Still can't no days off, which, yeah. <laughs> Straight in. And how about, how about you, Mo? Like, how is it when your, your athlete <laughs> is going up to perform and it's totally out of your hands? Okay. What's the feeling? That's a funny one because she was just saying that I was... Cu- being calm around her but that actual was I actually calm I thought you were calm until you told <laughs> like me from the inside I'm I'm like all over the place yeah. okay uh, and this is I think this is normal because you have you're coaching someone and they're going for competition so definitely they want them to like perform as best as they can and to win um, I wasn't like having a bad nervous a good nervous but I, w- I believe in her big time uh, because she trained a lot and she did all what he said like from in terms of marina in terms of nutrition mm. uh, from like the training the program and everything she've done everything so basically the week before we were saying we've done everything we can so whatever uh, the result is going to be in the competition we're going to be happy with that definitely yeah, we were nice aiming to... we were aiming for like to have the gold uh, but having second that was amazing as well uh, so I remember she, um, the first day, like in the qualifying was fine, but in the main competition, so they call you an hour before the race to okay. warm up. Once she left, I was like <laughs> calling, 
uh, I had a couple of trainers like Omran and other people coming to watch. So I'm calling him, where are you guys? I'm nervous. I can't sit on <laughs> as, the as if, you're, as if you're performing, yeah. right? I feel like it's worse though watching because you're not in control. Yeah. Right? It's at least I'm going and yeah. doing it, whereas you but have no control. I was control trying as much happening. as I can the whole weekend to stay calm, to actually speak to her positive, you know, into positive uh, sayings I and didn't like know mindset. You were just basically giving her all the positive uh, energy and trying to lift her up to mm. perform well. But inside me, I was going crazy. <laughs> and I remember texting Marina. I said, Marina, I'm going crazy. What can I do? I'm so nervous. <laughs> just don't let it show. Yeah, poker face. Yeah, there you go. It. Poker yeah. face. You'll uh, rack in <laughs> your own winnings there. Interesting fact. So I manifested. Okay. Oh. The winning time. So I gave Mo a piece of paper. We had a bet on who would get closest to the winning time. So I put that the winning time will be 7.24.7. The girl okay. who won did that exact. No exact way, exact. really. So you manifested it for yourself. I know. But, but even <laughs> Carrie Mum was like, you manifested it for me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, that was a, so yeah, that was a crazy was one. The exact number. Exact Imagine number. with the seconds and even milliseconds. Really so 7.24.7. Yeah. You got the exact, sum, uh, exact number. <sighs> I uh, think that's that's one of the things that kind of generally in life, if you've if you've left nothing on the table and you've done everything in your power, then you know you can only mm. do what what you can. Yeah. And that's it was very it was a nice feeling going into the competition, knowing that actually we've given everything to training that that I felt like there was nothing more we could have done. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did say to my eyes, I thought I would be disappointed if I didn't necessarily win, but I just said all I want to feel is that like I come off the rower and I can't move and, and then I know that I've given everything yeah. and that's why I felt because what was the so time difference between first and second four seconds okay four seconds well it was just at the end wasn't it I was leading yeah. oh really so, so how is that when you're when you're sort of racing or rowing are you focused on just your screen in front of you or are so you or was, are you kind of peripheral vision I when we did the first qualifier I kept like looking away and Mo was in front of me and he kept saying like focus <laughs> so he was very much like he was like because you could see the top three on the rower when you're going so only the top three people you can see how far ah, you are apart okay and you can see um, like how many far like how meters far away from the first second third and I Mo was see. like I don't want you to look at that until because you concentrate on your because that's going to ruin time. your game plan isn't it exactly so yeah, yeah so you don't so I wasn't allowed to look at it until the last 500 and I was surprised at how in the zone yeah. I was. How how was the event and the organisation and especially, you know, the, the whole sort of female side to it, right? Was there a kind of a palpable energy, a good atmosphere? How was how was that? Like afterwards it was amazing, wasn't yeah. it? The it was really like, nice. I think the the Rowing Federation was yeah, it was everyone was really welcoming and it was a, it was fantastic. Mm. It was really nice. Um the actual organisation leading up was was, was, wasn't the was best, Saudi at last minute, <laughs> so it wasn't the best. But yeah, I think the whole included, considering I, I think I was the only international. Yeah. They like, were very, very inclusive and like people that I talk to now and yeah, yeah. it was really nice to be part of. So, yeah. what, so what's the plan? You mentioned January? January is the Nationals. The Nationals. And um, I, I've been told from one of the guys who also like ruined the... From the guys, like he's not in Saudi national team, but he's a uh, he's an Egyptian as well. He won second. Uh, I'm mad. He said that there's in February. Uh, it's a World Cup, I think, something in indoor rowing that you can do online, where it's a mix. So you oh, do two girls, two guys, uh, but there has to be two Saudis. So probably th- if it's something gonna happen, hopefully she's gonna join it. And we're thinking soon as well, uh, or maybe end of the year actually. 2023 the world indoor championship so okay. this is gonna be a good one as well oh so your calendar is is getting uh, booked off no, already no holidays allowed <laughs> no. going international <laughs> <laughs> oh that's amazing yeah because like you n- you never thought you would be going this route but this is what since I coming like here one no and not at all and from doing one rowing class like yeah. this yeah. is like putting I yourself out video. there <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how, yeah how was she <laughs> awful <laughs> No, actually, she was good because this is like when I saw her numbers doing this, I was like, oh, wow, she's strong because mm. Emma is tall. Um, so I was like, why don't you try to basically train properly for this and try to go for the national championship? Yeah, because it happened with me like 
growing for me was just like I, I love it, I include it in the workout, but I don't grow properly. But then one time someone told me, okay, come try, there's a, a preparatory competition mm. and a camp. And I tried it, I loved it. I said like, okay, let me try to do it properly. And then this all of this happened. Mm. Just properly, yeah. this, the same happened with Emma. So. But this is the thing, it's like putting yourself out there to do one thing and you never ever know what's going to come of it. Yeah. yeah. So it's always worth giving it a go. Yeah, because that, that's what, like, you, you, you sucked it up for one class, you did the class, yeah. and then five months later of training four, five, six times a week, yeah. and then you've, you've sort of landed at silver at the Saudi Games, which is sort of an impressive feat. Because, I mean, you, yeah, you, you've always amazing. been training to some extent, yeah. haven't you? I've always trained, so you had I've a just decent never had a baseline. focus, yeah. focus yeah. to it. So yeah. I think that's what's and the good thing, been the like, difference. And the good you've been... PBing probably every month. Yeah. Like, it's because I have a good coach and a good nutritionist. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're, put, you're putting the, the work, honestly. And as we said, like, for, it's not only about training, it's about recovery, it's about nutrition. We are taking care of every single detail about the whole journey, mm. not only one part of it, because everything. There's a, there's a mental support as well that I yeah. get from like both of them. I think that's the big impact. Because mm. like I was saying, I've never had a personal trainer, really, I've never had a, yeah. had that. And I think you need that when you're training that much. And the and check Especially on and... the bad days. Like, definitely, again, this is one thing as well, everyone needs to know that it's not always. It's not going to be always. Sunshine. Yeah. You're like PBing every day, doing your best every day. No, you're going to have some days where you're going to feel low. You're going to feel that you need support. Uh, and this is like, I saw it like some days. <laughs> and, and that is like, that's absolutely fine. And that is expected. Exactly. Right. It's, and we're humans, right? So yeah. at some point, you're going to feel that you're not in your best shape in that day. And like, the, if you have like, if you're stressed or anything, plus you're doing these tough workouts. So. I think it's I had one of... when I texted you after four sets and I was just like, I can't do it. Yeah. I literally can't do it. And he was like, I'm coming to call now. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Emergency. <laughs> yeah. And did you finish it? Or... I finished it. But, but that is but the thing, like you, you just... those bad times, it's about getting into the yeah. gym, doing something mm. and just accumulating that because, you know, I don't think anyone's started a session and regretted it no. or no. you know started a session and, and sort of not got something out of it yeah. so yeah, there is exactly. always benefit even if you just go to the gym and walk on the treadmill for 10 minutes because yeah, you're feeling lousy something. like that's better than than skipping it yeah. because, i think that's when you mentally grow as a person as well yeah. when you do mm -hmm. start to build those habits it becomes it's discipline and consistency not motivation exactly yeah Exactly. You can't be going at a hundred percent all the time. Yeah. You can't be it's it's consistency over intensity. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's honing and crafting and you know, uh, finding what your discipline is in mm -hmm. terms of how yeah. you work best and is that structure, schedule, support, mm. or is it something else? But yeah. you only find that out by doing it. Yeah. Exactly. And then you learn and then you grow and then you can implement that in other areas of life. I mean and... I still tell you that I should PP every week. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> <laughs> but what I want to say to everyone that you don't have to beat yourself that if one day you had uh, like a bad workout or you, you feel that you're tired, you can't push enough, just being there into the gym or going for a walk, as you said, doing that small thing will make a difference for you. So just don't say, oh, no, I didn't work out today because I'm feeling tired or I don't feel I'm, I'm not feeling good. Uh, don't beat yourself. It's fine. One day you if you're smashing five days a week and one day of them is not good, that's fine, mm, completely mm, fine. Mm. We're humans, we get like stressed and lots of stuff, lots of pressure from lots of different stuff, like work, personal life, family, you know. Cats. Uh, cats, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Mo's cat, that, that deserves oh. a, whole, uh, a whole episode. A whole yeah. That's my Tune son. Tune in next week. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have Mo's cat on the show. <laughs> is my son. You might hear it here because um, the doors open and then cats run inside the building. Oh. So you hear like, meow, <laughs> like through the hallways and it's kind of eerie and creepy yeah. and they're just, they're lost souls. Oh my God. Going around the radio station. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> yeah. We digress. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's the whole thing. Like sometimes when she get that those bad days, I'm as a coach. Uh, it's not only be me being a coach, but being like a friend. Mm. Uh, assure her that she's actually doing great. Like smashing all these sessions, doing every day, hours in the rowing, and lots of sessions that she's been doing great and doing PBs. Just one, this one session is not feeling good. That's completely fine. Yeah, you're gonna 
if this is not good, you just keep pushing. Continue. Just the main thing, don't quit, you know. Continue, and then I will assure you that the day before, the day after or the week after, you're going to smash the workout, 100%. Yeah, it will happen. That's it. And so my last question to both of you, and this is what I ask all my guests, is when, when you're walking down the street in Saudi, <laughs> down the street, down the corniche, there in the sun, amongst the, the hustle of, of people going about their day, what goes through your head? What do you think? I can't believe I live in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of like a pinch me because yeah. I, I get that as well where it's I like oh my god I'm in I'm in I'm living in Saudi yeah. Arabia this is crazy I, I do have, get yeah, that I would have the same answer because I remember back in Egypt before I come to Saudi uh, I get to know lots of people saying yeah I'm traveling to Saudi just to like work for a couple of years and I will come back um, and then they don't come back <laughs> <laughs> And then this has happened to me. Uh, I remember before leaving and then my friends telling me, oh, you're just going to Saudi. I'm not going to see you again. I said, no, 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 just a year or two and I'll be back to Egypt. And then now next year, I'm going to be 10 years here. Imagine. Really? 10 years? Yeah. 10 years. Oh my God, I didn't know it was that much. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. But I'm mm. loving it, honestly. Like if I'm going to say, this is my second home. I love it. And I love the people as well. Uh, everything is happening at the moment with the events, with the fitness industry mm. everything is growing we're having more people coming you know new and knowing no more people and uh growing your network is amazing that's definitely meeting new people mm. it's the land of opportunity it is. yes it really is it is exactly nice so any final words to the uh, the listeners <laughs> thank You'll... you for listening to us <laughs> so, yeah honestly <laughs> thank you and yeah. Uh, if you're going to speak about the sports side, please don't uh, give up. Just go and try new things, have new goals, achieve it. And if you achieve it, don't stop. Find a new goal. You never know what will come of Exactly. Out. Exactly. Keep going, guys. I wonder what sport I'm going to take up. <laughs> Join me on rowing. Join... <laughs> no, we're talking about the, the whole national team of rowing. Maybe if they will get injured again. I'm not again, sharing I might him jo- with anyone. And he's only my coach. <laughs> yeah, no, how much would it cost to uh, to transfer you? I would Don't worry. <laughs> and Marina. And... Yeah, we have the whole team the ready. The whole team. <laughs> Amazing. So we'll, we'll close out the show there this evening. I hope you found it interesting interesting and i hope you've been inspired to either get out there try something new or maybe just go for a walk this evening anything anything is better than nothing so once again thank you emma thank you mo thank you thank so much you. and um well we'll have you both on when you win gold inshallah yes either way if it you win ha- gold silver or don't qualify we'll it have you on again happen, <laughs> yes. gold amazing gold, gold. so thank you for listening <laughs> oh my god okay last one for the listeners for people who are thinking about coming to Saudi Arabia from anywhere in the world what would your advice be to them take the risk just don't listen to anyone who didn't actually come to Saudi because you have to come here first and experience everything because it's completely different than anyone says yeah. from outside uh, it's fun there's Everything happening here, uh, lots of opportunities, lots of uh, people to know and to interact to interact with, and you're just gonna enjoy it, honestly. Yeah, I think take the risk, put yourself out there, and you might be winning silver slash three hundred k. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Never would have done that in the UK. Yeah. <laughs> enjoy. Stay tuned to the next one.